ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله واحسن الهدي هدى محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله uh, before we begin of course you know the brothers know me i have to make a correction the sheikh said that i'm sheikh daud adib and we all know that's not true except uh, if allah allows me to live about five more years and then i can be a sheikh linguistically inshallah not in terms of knowledge um, secondly we like to say that um, we apologize for being late because there was an oversight um, there was an oversight on some of the brothers part the brothers meaning myself and some of the brothers on the other side of the water in New Jersey uh, and some miscommunication and that's the reason why we're 15 or 16 minutes late so we apologize for that and thirdly we also apologize because of the second reason because of some miscommunication um, the subject that I had prepared for when I came from Kansas City, Missouri this morning or last night has been preempted what we're talking about is that the job and that's what I prepared for and the punishment and the trials of the grave but Sheikh Muhammad Musa Nasser is going to be dealing with a Dajjal and I was told that just three, four hours ago so unfortunately I'm not prepared for that of which I won't be doing inshallah and we intend to do something else and that is not listed here inshallah we get some benefit from it and lastly because of that um, because of the short time and once again this is, has nothing to do with the brothers this is not the mistake of the brothers this is just something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained and we couldn't get around it uh, I tried my best to find something to to relate this topic uh, to relate about this topic so I borrowed this book from my brother in Islam whose name I won't mention uh, and alhamdulillah he had it in his home and this is Sahih uh, al-Jam al-Saghir wa Ziyadatuhu and this is by Imam al-Suyuti with the checking of Sheikh Nasr Deen al-Albani and we hope that all of you brothers and you sisters get this book which is in two volumes from the Sheikh al-Albani where he brings all of the hadiths that Sheikh Imam al-Hafid al-Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi brought before him and this particular section of this book, for those who will make the reference, we have the entire or one of the narrations in its entirety of the events of the grave. And it's on page 344, hadith number 1676, for those who want to write it down. 1676 on page 344. And likewise, we have this book written by our brother, Sheikh Muhammad Al-Jibali. It was compiled by him. And you can see it as it is in front of me in the Huda newspaper. Uh, he has a whole series, al barzakh and sickness, and funerals, and wills, and testaments, and the final requests. Uh, and there's a very good series that I think every Muslim should get, because these things now, alhamdulillah, are being afforded us in the English language. So now we begin the hadith, inshallah, and we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the success and the straightness in what we're going to say. This hadith, as we mentioned, is one of the hadiths from the companions of the Messenger of Allah that they narrated from the Prophet himself, 
sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And this one is the famous one from Al-Bara ibn Azib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Where he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إن العبد المؤمن إذا كان في انقطاع من الدنيا وإقبال من الآخرة نزل إليه من السماء ملائكة ذيب الوجوه كأن وجوههم الشمس معهم كفن من أكفان الجنة وحنوط من حنوط الجنة حتى يجلسوا منه مد البصر ثم يجيء ملك الموت حتى يجلس عند ربه فيقول أيتها النفس الطيبة أخرجي إلى موفرة من الله وردوان فتخرج فتسير كما تسير القطرة من في السقاء فيأخذها فإذا أخذها لم يدعوها في يده طرفة عينا حتى يأخذوها فيجمعوا فيجعلوها في ذلك الكفن وفي ذلك الحنوط ويخرج منها كأطيب نفحة مسك وجدت على وجه الأرض فيصعدون بها فلا يمرون على ملأ من الملائكة إلا قالوا ما هذا الروح الطيب فيقولون فلان بن فلان بأحسن أسمائه التي كانوا يسمونه بها في الدنيا حتى ينته به إلى السماء الدنيا فيستفتحون له فيفتح له فيشيعه من كل سماء مقربوها إلى السماء التي تليها حتى ينتهي إلى السماء السابعة فيقول الله عز وجل اكتبوا كتاب عبدي في عليين وأعيد عبدي إلى الأرض فإني منها خلقتهم وفيها أعيدهم ومنها أخرج أخرجهم فرة أخرى and we're going to end it here and inshallah to give the English translation up to this point this narration that we find in the book of Al-Barzakh by our brother Sheikh Muhammad Al-Jabari and we find it on page 7 beginning on page 7 of this book called Al-Barzakh that I hope is being sold so all of us can run out and buy this book so none will be left inshallah it says that Al-Bara ibn Azib radiallahu ta'ala anhu reported that they the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went out with Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the funeral of a man from the Ansar they reached the location of the grave before it was dug the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi sat down facing the Qibla and they sat around him quietly as if dis- afraid to disturb birds standing on their heads He held in his hand a stick with which he was moving the earth. He looked toward the sky, then toward the earth, raising and lowering his hands three times. He said to them two or three times, seek refuge in Allah from the punishment of the grave. Then he said three times, O Allah, I seek refuge in you from the punishment of the grave. Then, the part that we've been reading in Arabic, he continued. The message of Allah, the English translation is, He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Verily, when a believing Abd is at the point of departure from the world and is about to enter the next life, angels descend from heaven. Their faces are white, and another narration says it's white and bright like the sun. They carry with them a shroud from the clothes of Al-Jannah, an embalmment from the fragrance of Jannah. They sit away from him at the limit of his eyesight, meaning as far as the human being's eyesight can carry. They sit away from him at the limit of his eyesight. The angel of death then arrives, sits by his head, and says, O good and peaceful soul, the part to Allah's forgiveness and pleasure. On hearing this, the soul leaves the body as easily as water drops flow from the spout of a water skin. And he, the angel of death, takes it, meaning takes the soul. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to include us among these people. Ameen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to include our brother Abu Mujahid Abdul Rahim from Baltimore, Maryland, who was killed by the police just the other day. Oh Allah, include him among these people. Ameen.
When the soul leaves his body, all angels between the heavens and the earth, and nobody knows how many angels there are except Allah, all the angels between the heavens and the earth, and all the angels in the heavens pronounce salah on him. And we know salah here means dua. Dua al istighfar, seeking forgiveness for the soul. All gates of heavens are open for him. All of the gates of heaven are open for him. The guardians of every single gate implore Allah that this soul ascends in their direction. The angels are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make, inshallah, your soul, when the time comes for you, your soul, oh Allah, bring that soul close to me. And then, when the angel of death takes the soul, they, the other angels, do not leave it, do not leave it in his hand for as little or as short as the time of the blinking of an eye. They take it and place it in their shroud and embalmment. And to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَوَفَّتْقُوا رُسُولُنَا وَهُمْ لَا يُفَرْرِطُونَ our messengers take his soul and they never neglect their duty. There animates from the soul the best smelling scent of musk that ever existed on the surface of the earth. And there's some brothers right now that are selling some oils, some perfumes, and a lot of us, we have our preferences. We have what we like from among the oils and the fragrances of the earth. But from this particular body and from this soul is going to emanate and exude the best smell that you have ever smelled that you cannot smell on the earth. The angels then ascend with it as they pass by the gatherings of other angels and then the other angels ask, what is this good soul? They, the angels, will reply, it is so and so, using the best names with which he has been addressed in the first life meaning the life of the dunya. When they reach the lowest heaven, they ask for permission to enter, and the gates will be open for them. They ask for the gates to be open for them. The most elite, the most elite angels of each heaven escort him to the next one until he reaches the seventh heaven. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ مَا عِلِّيُّونَ Write my servant's record in the عِلِّيُّونَ And what will make you what the عِلِّيُّونَ is? And ascribe the register witnessed by those nearest to Allah among the angels. Thus, his records are inscribed in the عِلِّيُّونَ And we ask Allah, by His greatest name, O oh Allah, let our names be inscribed in the Illiyun. Amen. And the angels are told, take him back to the earth, because I promised them that I, from it, I created them, into it I returned them, and from it I resurrect them once again. And we like to make a special note here that there's an ayah in Surah Taha, similar to this statement, in this hadith, from it we took you, to it we're going to return you, and from it we're going to take you once again, that people use when they put the dead body into the ground, they take a handful of dirt, from it we've taken you, to it we return you, and from it we'll take you once again. And this hadith is extremely weak with the chain of it, is extremely weak, and it's a bid'ah if you say that while you're throwing those three handfuls of dirt in the grave, so stay far away from the bid'ah, because every bid'ah is astray, every astray is in the hellfire. So the hadith, it goes on and says, He is then returned to the earth, and his soul is returned to his body, so that he hears the thumping of his companion's shoes as they walk away from his grave. The hadith goes on as the Prophet ﷺ said, فَتُعَادُ رُوحُهُ فَيَتِيهِ مَلَكَانِ 
فيجلسانه فيقولان له من ربك فيقول ربي الله فيقولان له ما دينك فيقول دين الاسلام فيقولان له ما هذا الرجل الذي بعث فيكم فيقول هو رسول الله Two angels of severe reprimand then come to him and shake him. They make him sit up. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how that's going to be done. It's done by the permission of Allah and by his power and his might. The angels do it without flinching. How he sits up in the grave, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. If we open up the grave, we won't see the person sitting up because that's a life that's different from our life. The life of Al-Barzakh is a different life, so don't expect to see it. It is something of the ghaib, something that is hidden from our view, so don't expect to see it. But you have to believe in it 100, 1,000, 1 million percent. So the Prophet wasallam said that the angels sit him up in his grave and they ask him, Who is your Lord? Who is your Lord? And the person, and we hope that's us, we hope that we answer this question properly. The person's going to say, my Lord is Allah. And you need to teach your children to say this. Who is your Lord? Teach your children. Who is your Lord? Tell them to say, Rabbi Allah, my Lord is Allah. Your children shouldn't be walking around talking about Power Rangers, and Ninja this, and Wu-Tang Clan, and Cameron. You ask one of your kids, who's your Lord? He says, Puffy, Puff Daddy. I hold them in that. You know, you have some kids that run around saying this. Teach your children who is their Lord. Ask your child right now, running around, who's your Lord? See what they say. My Lord is Allah. Teach your children to say, my Lord is Allah. Teach them in Arabic. Remember the book at, who is your Lord? Your child should say, Rabbi Allah. Even if they don't know what they're saying. Rabbi Allah. Then, Madinuk, what is your deen? My deen is al-Islam. My deen is al-Islam. Then they will ask him the third question. Who is that man who was sent to you? He replies, he is Allah's messenger. Then they are going to ask him, what did you do? فَيَقُولَانِ لَهُ مَا عَمَلُكَ what did you do? فَيَقُولُوا قَرَدْتُ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ فَآمَنْتُ بِهِ وَصَدَّقْتُ What did you do? Meaning, what did you do in the dunya? What did you do with your time in the dunya? Then we, inshallah, or oh Allah, allow us to be of these people who answer this question properly. Amen. We are going to say, inshallah, I read Allah's book. I read Allah's book. While we were on TWA flight 1628 coming to Brooklyn, we didn't, we didn't read Ebony Magazine, Black Enterprise, Home and Garden. Some of y'all are reading Home and Garden, living in the projects. I was reading the Quran in the dunya. What did you do? I was reading the book of Allah. I believed in it and obeyed it. See, because a lot of us could say we were reading the Quran, but we didn't believe in it and obey it. We just read it. I read the book of Allah. I believed in the book of Allah. And I obeyed the book of Allah. Then the angels, the Prophet wasallam, said, they shake him again. Asking him, who is your Lord? What is your deen? Who is your prophet? And this is the final fitna, the final test, the final tribe to which a believer is subjected to. In this regard, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ Allah keeps the believers firm with firm words in the first life and in the last one. And of course, the firm words is La ilaha illallah. He repeats, My Lord is Allah, my deen is Islam, and my prophet is Muhammad 
صلى الله عليه وسلم فينادي مناد من السماء أن صدق عبدي فأفرشوه من الجنة وألبسوه من الجنة وافتحوا له بابا إلى الجنة فيأتيه من روحها وتيبها ويفسح له في قبره مدة بصره ويأتيه رجل حسن الوجه حسن الثياب طيب الريح فيقول أبشر أبشر بالذي يسرك هذا يومك الذي كنت توعد فيقول له من أنت فوجهك الوجه يجيء بالخير فيقول أنا عملك الصالح فيقول ربي أقم الساعة ربي أقم الساعة حتى أرجع إلى أهلي ومالي A caller then calls out from the heavens My servant has spoken the truth So provide him with the furnishings from Al Jannah Clothe him from the clothing of Al Jannah And open for him a door to Al Jannah Oh Allah, I ask you to give all of us listening to my voice And those who are not listening to my voice Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I call you by your greatest name to let us be included in, in this category. Amen. Thus he receives provision and perfume from the Jannah. And his grave is spread to the extent of his eyesight. The grave is stretched open as far as your eyesight can go. And this doesn't make any difference, brothers and sisters, if you were like the illustrious, eminent, prominent sheikh of this ummah, mufti of this nation, Abdul Aziz ibn Abdullah Abbas, rahmatullahi rahmatan wasi'atan alayhi, who is physically blind. It doesn't make any difference if you are blind in the dunya. You're still going to be able to see as far as your sight can see. Before him appeared a man with a pleasant face, nice garments, and a good smell. He'll say to him, and we hope we include it in that number when the saints go marching in, I am to you, or I give to you glad tidings that will please you. Tidings of Allah's acceptance and gardens with everlasting bliss. This is the day that you have been promised. He responds, glad tidings from Allah be to you. Who are you? Your face is one that brings goodness. He says, I am your good deeds. I swear by Allah, I only knew you quick in obeying Allah. Your good deeds will say, I swear by Allah, I only knew you to be quick to obey Allah. I only knew you to be quick to obey Allah and slow in disobeying Him. May Allah reward you with good. Then a door is open for him to Jannah and another one to the hellfire. And he is told, this, meaning the fire, would have been your dwelling place had you disobeyed Allah. But Allah has substituted it for you with this Jannah. When he sees what is awaiting him in Al-Jannah, meaning of the pleasures of Al-Jannah, he says, O oh my Lord, speed up the arrival of the hour, so that I may rejoin my family and, and my property. And our Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al uthaymeen I remember him explaining this. He gives a detailed explanation the short version of it, even for the people who didn't have a family in this life, meaning a wife and children, or didn't have any property in this life, they will be given an exchange of better what they had, or they will be given something greater than what they had in this, in the, in this dunya, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this, and that is the shortened version of course of what the shaykh says. Then he is told, after he asked Allah to rejoin him to his family and his property, he's told to calm down. وَإِنَّ الْعَبْدَ الْكَافِرَ إِذَا كَانَ فِي انْقِطَاعٍ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَإِقْبَالٌ مِنَ الْآخِرَةِ نَزَلَ إِلَيْهِ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَلَائِكَةٌ سُودُ الْوُجُوهِ مَعْهُمْ مُصُوحِ 
فيجلسون منه مد البصر ثم يجيء ملك الموت حتى يجلس عند رأسه فيقول أيتها النفس الخبيثة اخرجي الى سخط من الله وغضب فتفرقوا في جسده فينتزعها كما ينتزع السفود من السقوف المبلول فيأخذها فاذا اخذها لم يضعوها في يده ترفع عين ترفع عين حتى يجعلوها في تلك المصوح ويخرج منها كأنتني ريح جيفة وجدت على وجه الارض فيصعدون بها فلا يمرون بها على ملأ من الملائكة إلا قالوا ها ما هذا الروح ما هذا الروح الخبيث فيقولون فلان بن فلان بأقبح أسمائه التي كانت يسمى بها في الدنيا فيستفتح له فلا يفتلح ثم قرأ لا تفتح لهم أبواب السماء فيقول الله عز وجل اكتبوا كتابه في السجين في الأرض في الأرض أي في الأرض السفلى فتطرح, فتطرح روحه طرحا فتعاد روحه في جسده ويأتيه ملكان فيجلسانه فيقولان له من ربك فيقول آه آه لا أدري فيقولان له ما دينك فيقول آه آه لا أدري فيقولان له ما هذا الرجل الذي بعث فيكم فيقول آه آه لا أدري فينادي مناد من السماء أن كذب عبدي فأطبشوه من النار وفتح له وفتح له بابا إلى النار فيأتيه من حرها وسمومها ويضيق عليه قبره حتى تختلف اضلاعه ويتيه رجل قبيح الوجه قبيح الثياب منتن الريح فيقول ابشر الدلد الذي يسوءك هذا يومك الذي كنت توعد فيقول من انت فوجهك الوجه يجيء بالشر فيقول انا عملك الخبيث فيقول ربي لا تقم الساعة او كما قاله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم and verily when a disbeliever or disobedient a disbeliever or disobedient slave is at the point of departure from the worldly life and he or she is about to enter into the hereafter strong hulking angels with dark faces descend to him from the heavens. They bring with them tough fabrics from the hellfire. They sit away from him at the limit of his eyesight. The angel of death arrives, sits by his head, and says, O malicious soul, depart to a wrath and anger from Allah. On hearing this, it becomes terrified and clings to the body but he extracts it by force like a skewer is pulled from wet wool and I don't know if any of you know what a skewer is that thing that you extract the defective parts of the wool when some things have become mixed with it when you're trying to purify it and if you've ever seen a skewer when you're trying to pull things from the wool from it it's very very difficult it snags it if you can imagine some claws like a rake that you use to rake your yard if you can imagine trying to take that through a burlap stack if you can imagine trying to take a, a rake and rake it through a burlap rack or a sack it's very very difficult this is the only example that I can think of that comes to my mind but he extracts it by force like a skewer is pulled from wet wool, not dry wool, wet wool, causing the veins and nerves to burst. May Allah keep this far away from us. Amen. Every angel between the heavens and the earth, and every angel in the heavens curses him. Every angel curses him. The gates of the heavens are shut, the guardians of every gate implore Allah that this soul does not ascend 
in their direction. In other words, Allah keep this soul away from us. It's mutantina, it stinks, it's reeking with a pungent smell. Keep it away from us. We don't want this stenchful thing near us. Because of course the angels don't like things that smell bad. But the angel of death, Malakul Maut, not known as Israel because the narrations are not authentic calling it Israel, all we have is the description of the angel called Malakul Maut. When Malakul Maut takes the soul, then the other angels don't leave it in his hand for as little as the blinking of an eye. And this is a proof that angels, at least this angel, have hands. They put it in the fabric that they have from the hellfire and from it emanates the most repugnant, stinking, pungent, rancid, wretched smell like the odor or worse than the odor of a decaying cadaver that ever existed on the surface of the planet Earth. The angels then ascend with it. As they pass by the gatherings of the other angels, those angels ask, What is this Rasul Khabib? What is this malicious soul? May Allah not make us of those malicious souls. Amen. The angels holding it respond, He is so and so, son of so and so, using the worst names with which he has been addressed in the first life, meaning in the dunya. When they reach the lowest heaven, meaning when they are ready to go back, getting closer and closer to the earth, they ask for permission to enter, but the gates are not open for him, going upward. And then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He recited this ayah لا تفتح لهم أبواب السماء ولا يدخلون الجنة حتى يلج الجمل في سم الخياط For them, meaning the disbelievers and the disobedient The gates of heaven will not be open And we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to not make us of these people and they will not enter Al-Jannah or Allah enters into your Jannah until the candle goes through the eye of the needle. Allah then says, write his record in Sajin in the lowest earth. And they are told, take him back to the earth because I promised them that from it I create them and into it I return them and from it I resurrect them once again. His soul is then cast down from the heavens without regard and it falls into his body and this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped it. He recited, وَمَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَكَأَنَّمَا خَرَّ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَتَخْطَفُهُ الطَّيْرُ وَتَهْوِي أَوْ تَهْوِي بِهِ الرِّيْحُ فِي مَكَانٍ سَحِيقٍ As for the one who joins partners with Allah it is as if he plunges down from the skies whereupon birds snatch him off or the wind cast him away to a remote place from Allah's mercy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us like those people. His soul is restored to his body and in another narration that I remember his soul is flung into his body. It's not returned gently. His soul is flung violently into his body so that he hears the thumping of his companions thumping meaning the thumping of their shoes as they walk away from the grave two angels of severe reprimand come to him and shake him they make him sit up and ask him who is your lord he will reply uh, uh, I don't know and in the other narration we know that's in Al-Bukhari, he will say, uh, uh, I don't know, I only say what the people say. I only say what I heard the people say. Like my father. May Allah give him what he deserved, who I buried this, in this past Ramadan, who I invited to Islam for 24 and a half years, 
On some occasions he used to say that he was Allah. On other occasions he would say that women were Allah. On another occasion he would pull out a lot of money from his pocket and say this is Allah. He's going to say, uh, uh, I only say what I heard the people say. And this might sound harsh to some people sitting here that that brother is talking about his father like this. But I have to talk about him like this. Because my father didn't accept this land. As I stood in front of his grave this past Ramadan with tears in my eyes, not so much that I lost my father, but because, as I said to him, I loved you, Daddy, and I invited you to Islam for 24 years and you rejected it. And so I said to him as I walked away, the last person walking away was me, I said what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say when he used to visit the graves of the Kuffar. لَقَدَ سَبَقَ هَاُلَائِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Surely these people have missed a lifetime of good. Surely these people, they missed a world of good. They missed it. I invited you, Daddy, for 24 years I invited you to the clear path of Tawheed. And now, nothing's going to be able to help you. Nothing's going to be able to help you. My father's going to say, and he already said it, uh, uh, I only said what the people said. Money is Allah. Master Farah Muhammad is Allah. Buddha is Allah. I only say what the people say. So then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the angels will say, What is your deen? He will say, uh, uh, I, I don't know. Then he will ask him, Who is that man that was sent to you? And some people may say, how can we apply this part of the hadith, that man that was sent to him, to him or to the people of this world? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died 1400 years ago. How are we included? He was sent to us because he was the messenger to all mankind. And no one that has any sense among the Muslims will reject that. And then, as one narration says, when, it was to be, when it's going to be asked of him, who is that man that was sent to you? Some of the people are going to say, meaning the disobedient and the kuffar are going to say, all of them, he cannot recall his name. I cannot recall his name. And I swear by Allah, I know at least one person that won't be able to say that, and that's my father. My father will not be able to say this in truth. I can't recall his name. Muhammad. He says, I don't know. I just heard the people say that. Then he will be told, you did not know and you did not recite the Quran. A call is going to call from the heavens. He lies. So spread for him furnishings from the fire. And open for him a door to the fire. Thus it's heat and fierce hot wind reach him and his grave is tightened around him causing his ribs to break before him appears a man with an ugly face repulsive clothes and a foul smell he says I am to give to you evil tidings I am to give to you evil tidings that will surely displease you. This is the day that you have been promised. As I told my father, accept this lamb, daddy, and you'll be given that which no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and the heart or the mind of a person could ever conceive. And the similarity of this life and the things in this life with the similarity of the things in El Jannah, Daddy, the pomegranates, the apples, the fruits, the vegetables, the women, whatever it is, is only similar in name. I used to tell my father, you know those chickens you like, Daddy, those roast chickens? All you have to do is think about the chicken. Just desire the chicken. And it will come to you already baked or roasted, flying in the air, just eat it. But if you reject, Daddy, if you reject, and I don't know how many times at that green kitchen table that still stands while he's in the grave catching it, 
I don't know how many times I said this to him and how many times I told him, if you don't accept this land, daddy, then you are going to catch something that's going to be so great, a torture that's going to be so horrendous as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has already mentioned to us in this hadith. So the evil deeds will come to that person and he will say, evil tidings from Allah be to you too. Who are you? The face, your face is one that brings evil. He says, I am your malicious deeds. And of course the kuffar don't have anything but malicious deeds. They don't have anything but bad deeds, no matter what they did in this life. Then they will say, I swear by Allah, I only knew you to be slow in obeying Allah and quick in disobeying Him. And may Allah repay you with evil. A blind, deaf, and dumb person is appointed for him. He carries in his hand a sledgehammer. Now it's hammer time. A sledgehammer. And he's going to hit him. And if he were to hit a mountain, it would turn it into dust. He hits him with it once, and he becomes dust. Allah then restores him as he was. Can you imagine brothers being hit with a hammer, and the hammer is so hard that you immediately turn into dust? Can you imagine being hit with something that immediately turns you into, into dust particles? May Allah protect us from this. Allah then will restore him, restore him to the way he was, and the person hits him again. He sounds out with a shriek that is heard by every single creature except the men and jinns. A door is opened for him to the fire, and he is given the furnishings from the fire. He is given the furnishings from the fire. And then he will say, O oh my Lord, do not establish the hour. And this is the end of this hadith that is collected by Imam Ahmed and Abu Dawood and others. And it was authenticated by a Sheikh al arunaut and also a Sheikh Muqbil and also a Sheikh Muhammad ibn Nuh al Najati, commonly known as Nasruddin al Albani. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, this particular story that is actually the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the accounts in the grave, the trial in the grave, the interrogation of the grave, the fitna and the punishment, the adab of the qabr is something that each and every one of us should reflect upon every day in our lives and how can we not when death is constantly around us, how can we not, when each and every day we were commanded by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to seek refuge with Allah from four things at the end of our Salah every single day. How is it that we can memorize every single thing else and we've been Muslims for three years or five years or ten years or fifteen years or twenty years or 30 years, and some of us boasting, I've been a Muslim 10 years, and we have not memorized and implemented and executed in our daily prayers, in our obligatory act, which is the statement, very small in size, but very tremendous on our scale, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min a'adhab al-qabr, wa a'udhu bika min a'adhab al-jahannam, وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّ فِتْنَةِ الْمَسِيحِ الدَّجَّالِ وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّ فِتْنَةِ الْمَحْيَا وَالْمَمَاتِ O oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from the punishment of the grave. And I seek refuge with you from the punishment of the hellfire. And I seek refuge with you from the evil of the trials of الدَّجَّال. And I seek refuge with you from the evil of the trials of the life and death. This is an obligatory, though there are differences of opinion, even if you take the weaker opinion, you still should be seeking refuge with Allah from these things because of the tremendous nature of the punishment and the trials of the grave. 
How could it be, brothers and sisters, that we wash a body, we shroud our brother or our sister in Islam daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, once in a lifetime, look at that body on that cadaver, that person who may or may not was just standing next to you in the Salah, like our brother Yusuf who was killed just not so long ago, who prayed the Salah to Isha with us, then after leaving the Salah to Isha, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, was stabbed to death. How can you wash that brother's body and not remember the punishment or the trials of the grave? We just go on through our day as though we're going to live forever, and as Abdullah ibn Umar has informed us, has warned us, has advised us, has encouraged us, encouraged us to remember in the morning time not to expect to see the evening, and the evening not to expect to see the morning. How is it that we can go through our daily lives, going past these graveyards with these big, huge, big eye tombstones, and not be reminded that there's me, and we hope not me with a tombstone on it, and not me with a tuxedo or bridal gown on, but there is, that's me right there, riding down the parkway or the turnpike. That's me right there. I'm next. How could we go through our daily lives, seeing all of these events, hearing of people being killed all throughout the world, and not be reminded of the punishment and the trials of the grave? My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, the time is now. The time is now. The time is now for us to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His mercy, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take away from us arrogance and pride that because we are Muslims, we think that we have it made, that we go to bed every night thinking that I'm going to wake up the next day a Muslim, but in fact we might just wake up a Mormon, or a Moody, or a follower of Drew Ali, the ignoble, not noble, but the ignoble Drew Ali, or the dishonorable Elijah Muhammad, as the brother, well I can't say brother anymore, as the person who I met, who told me, I swear in the name of Jesus, who used to pray right next to some of you right now sitting here, I know for a fact, because you and we pray together, the person who I can't call a brother anymore, who I hadn't seen in a number of years that I just saw not too long ago, who told me, I swear in the name of Jesus, who died for our sins, a Muslim for 18 years, I swear in the name of Jesus who died for our sins, Islam is wrong and Christianity is right. Or like the person who I remember, who I grew up with right here across the water, who I used to admire because he used to be able to write Arabic from memory and write Soros from memory. Now he's following Dr. Ben, a man who used to teach Tawheed in a masjid in North New Jersey, now following Dr. Ben, the Mushrik. How can we go through our daily lives hearing people, hearing about people, Muslims, leaving Islam and not think about the punishment of the trials in the grave? I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us more mindful of the trials, the fitna of the grave. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have forgiveness and mercy on those Muslims that we know and we don't know that have died. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring unity to the Muslims on La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on the methodology of our lightly guided predecessors, the Salaf al-Salih وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك. Thank you very much, Brother Dawood Adib. We have a question here.
And I've requested the brothers before we have a few minutes, about 10 minutes for questions, not too much because we have a change in the program. And um, there's one question here, and Brother Adib will ask, answer this question. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mnastanna bi sunnatihi wa man wala, wa ba'd. I've heard there was a difference of opinion among the Sahaba as to whether or not a dead person is punished in the grave due to the excess crying and wailing of his, of his family mourners. Please explain this if it is really, if it really is a difference of opinion. The answer to this question is yes, there was a difference of opinion and it was actually the, uh, the misunderstanding or I should say the lack of understanding of the meaning from our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and it was explained to her by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and also in another narration Abdullah ibn Abbas because Aisha she using the eye of the Quran لا تزل وازرة وزر أخرى that no soul will bear the burden of another no soul shall bear the burden of another so she did not understand properly the meaning of this ayah in light of the fact that the people who don't teach their family members their children and their wives not to bewail them or to scream out and cry like the people of Jahiliya screaming and hollering, tearing at their clothes and scratching their cheeks oh he's gone oh, oh, oh. and acting like the people of Jahiliya so because that person didn't teach their family that before they died then that person will receive a punishment and Allah knows the extent of the punishment because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't tell us the extent of the punishment that person will receive that and the strongest of opinion is what Abdullah ibn Masaru said and we accept what Abdullah ibn Masaru said and we know that our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha agreed with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud after that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. There's some that there's some people who are sending some questions up in Arabic and inshallah we're going to save those for the Shaykh. I'm going to read them and inshallah the answer we have these We'll say in days because he wants them to say those to the Shaykh, but we can read them inshallah if you want us to translate them anyway, and just in case the Shaykh doesn't mention it, and you can remind us. The hadith speaks about disbelievers or disobedient. Who, who is the disobedient? Are they Muslims? To the best of my knowledge, and Allah knows best, it means the kuffar, and I hope that I'm correct, but if it means the Muslim, then I ask Allah SWT to protect us, from being those disobedient people. I mean. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam. Is it true that when the person is asked the three questions in the grave, they will be asked in Arabic? If so, how will the person who never learned Arabic answer? Will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them answer in English or Arabic? Where would I be able to find this information? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best what language the person is going to be asking. I don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But I know one thing. It will be a language that you can understand and you'll definitely be answering it in a language that the angels can understand. <laughs> Whatever the language is. And let me just make a special note to that. There are some Muslims and I don't want to sound biased or anything because you usually hear from the Arabs you don't usually hear from the American Muslims and I'm not trying to be prejudiced but you usually hear from some of the Muslims, some of the Arab Muslims that Arabic is the language of Jannah I don't know of any proof of this I, I don't know, me personally I don't know of any proof that Arabic is the language of Jannah so if someone has a text that says Arabic is the language of Jannah then inshallah bring your proof no. 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 We'll save this, inshallah. This is a question we'll save for the sheikhs, inshallah. Yes. That's it, right?
Okay. There's a question, but we're going to save this for Sheikh Muhammad Musa Nasr because this is his topic. Can you talk to us briefly about the Dajjal? And since Sheikh Muhammad, he is uh, he's going to, he's going to take this particular topic. I don't have it. Alhamdulillah. Then inshallah. Yes, we did that. He's going to talk about the Dajjal. So we'll save that for Sheikh Muhammad Musa Nasr. And it seems as though we have exhausted all the questions. We ask Allah once again to not make us of those who take this subject of the punishment and the trials in the grave as something being light. It seems as though that the sister has sent something up. There's a brother coming, inshallah. The question is, is the soul going to be questioned about those who visit him or her in the grave? Is the soul going to be questioned about those who visit him or her in the grave? And what did he tell them about Islam? Is the soul going to be questioned about those who visited him or her in the grave? And what did he tell them about Islam? The angels? Is the person going to be asked about the angels? Are you sure that's what this, that she's saying? Ah, uh, did the, pers- the person, uh, in other words, the people who didn't get invited to Islam, well, that person, who, that Muslim who didn't invite people to Islam, will they be asked, uh, will those people be asked about not being invited? Is that what you mean? If a non-Muslim visits a Muslim in his grave, I don't know. Yeah, I don't understand it, inshallah. The only thing that I know about as far as dialogue is concerned is that some of the people, or I should say not some of the people, the prophet in one narration is collected by Imam Ahmed and his Muslim and mentions that the people when they receive some of the felicities of Jannah when they die and they're in the grave and the position of Barzakh when different souls come in after the person dies the people who died already before them are going to say where's so and so? where's so and so? so and so didn't come and if the people who are there, the souls that are there don't say that we don't see so and so that's going to let them know that so and so went in the other direction that they went to hell that's the only thing I know about dialogue, that the souls are going to have some type of dialogue. When a person comes and they just died, the souls are going to say, did you see so-and-so, or did you see so-and-so, where's so-and-so? And if they don't see so-and-so, that means that they went okay. to someplace else. So. As for the other question that was sent up, Allah knows this. Will parents be responsible for the sins of their children from ages to 7 to 20? Will the husband be responsible for his wife and daughter who do not wear hijab? We want to save this question for Sheikh Salim or Sheikh Osama or Sheikh Muhammad Musa Nasr. Is it permissible for women to go out of the car at the burial where the body is being put into the ground? Inshallah, we'll save this question for the mashayikh that have come. Now. The brother is asking the question if a certain amount of people come to the, to the burial there's going to be some type of reward or forgiveness for the person and this is true the Prophet Sallallahu has mentioned that if 40 people come and they make the Salat al Janazah for you and those 40 people didn't commit shirk those 40 people didn't commit shirk then inshallah Allah is going to forgive you of your sins inshallah The question, this question is in Arabic, inshallah, we're going to save it for the, sh- for the shaykhs that come, that came. It says, هَلْ أَتْفَالُ الْكُفَارُ هَلْ أَتْفَالُ الْكُفَارُ إِذَا مَاتُوا هُمْ هَأُلَّا يَكُونُ مَسِيرُهُمْ النَّارُ أَهُمْ صِغَارُ يَكُونُ مَسِيرُهُمْ النَّارُ The children of the kuffar, when they die, meaning the small children, is their end, their fate, going to be in the hellfire? 
We'll say this for the Mashaykh, inshallah. What do you think is going to happen to non-Muslims but who, do, who did many good deeds in their lives and they didn't even hear about Islam? The people who... The answer to the question is that those people who didn't hear the clear message of Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and another hadith is also collected by Imam Ahmed and his Musnad, that they, there are four people that are going to be able to plead their case. The first person is Asammu, the second person is, is Haramu, the third person is Ahmaqu, the fourth person is a person who came between the Fatra, when there was no Prophet. The first person is a person who couldn't hear, the second person is a person who is real old, the third person is the ignoramus, the fourth person is the person who came between two periods of times where there wasn't a Prophet. When those four people go to plead their case with their Lord, the person who couldn't hear, he will say, لَقَدْ جَاءَ إِلَيَّ الْإِسْلَامُ وَلَا أَسْمَعُ شَيْئًا or شَيْئًا That Islam came to me and I couldn't hear anything. The second person who is real old, he's going to say the same thing with exception. Islam came to me, وَلَا أَعْقِلُ شَيْئًا but I wasn't able to understand anything. The third person, the Ahmaq, the person who is an ignoramus, is going to say, Islam came to me when the children were throwing manure at me, were throwing dung at me. And the fourth person who came between a time when there is no prophet, all four of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's prophet said that a messenger or a person, a messenger or an individual will come to them and say to them, jump into the fire. Fire will be made for them, and it will be said to them, jump into the fire. If they jump into the fire, the fire will be made cool and safe for them. And if they don't jump into the fire, then that means if they didn't have those conditions that we just met, mentioned, that means they wouldn't have accepted it in, in the first place, Islam. And they will be thrown into the fire like the rest of the people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that because we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam that he wiped his hand, meaning Allah wiped his hand over the back of Adam and all the nesama, all the souls came out of the back of Adam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to those souls, Alas to be Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Qalu bala, shahidna. They said, they said, we said, all of us said, of course you are Lord. We bear witness. So no one is going to be able to say, even if they couldn't hear, even if they couldn't understand, or they were so old, even if they were ignoramuses, even though they were stillborn children, even if they were mischarried children, even if they were mentally retarded, it doesn't make any difference. Everybody, everyone said when Allah wiped his hand and a man of befitting his majesty over the back of Adam, all of us came out and said, of course you are our Lord. So no one will have an excuse because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kaf, وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا And your Lord is not unjust to anyone. Will the soul of the dead people be held accountable for the person who cries over them? Say, what will I do without so-and-so? What will I do without so-and-so? In other words, if the person says, Oh, what am I going to do? He's gone, he's gone. Oh, what am I going to do? She's gone and she's gone. Allah knows this. In order for me to make that statement, I would have to have a text from the book of Allah or the son of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or a statement from the Salaf al Salih or one of the Imams of the Salaf al Salih who can relate back to that golden chain because this is something of the ghaib, things that are hidden from our view and I don't have the ability or the propensity to talk about things that I can't see. How responsible am I for my wife's for my wife's son? Will Allah question me? Should I let him have contact with his Kafir father even though he has partial custody? Or should I keep him away? If I am 
if I am leaving for a Muslim country, should I leave without telling his Catholic father? This question we need to give to Sheikh Muhammad Musa Nasr and Sheikh Abu Usama Salim al Hilali, who have just come, inshallah, or Sheikh Usama al Qusi, wa sallallahu wa sallam, wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahabihi wa sallam, wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.